This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch launch a successful successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. What up, crowdfunders? Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. If it is your first time tuning in, my name is Salvador Brigman. And on this show, I bring on successful campaigners. You know, they've launched a campaign on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and they go into what's worked for them, what strategies they use to get backers, what tactics they found to be effective. And I also dive into their story. You know, what it was like emotionally to run one of these campaigns. It can really be a roller coaster ride. So if you are gearing up to the launch of an entirely new campaign, Rest assured, you're going to have way more confidence going in having listened to this show. Now, this episode is more geared to the filmmakers in the audience. If you're trying to raise money for an upcoming indie film, I think you're going to love this episode because the the person that I had on not only successfully raised money for a film, but they have a very interesting fundraising trajectory. And it almost kind of looked like they weren't going to be successful for a really long time. But at the end, they really mustered all of their energy. They got really serious about that campaign and they did a few things that totally boosted the funding meter of this campaign. And they ended up raising over $65,000 to produce an entirely new film. This is a feature film about four women who find unity, hope, and strength through one of the world's darkest tragedies. I think you're gonna also like the story for this one. But even if you are not trying to raise money for a film, a lot of the techniques, a lot of the strategies that we talk about on every single episode are applicable for other categories out there. So if you're trying to produce an entirely new cool technology gadget, or you're trying to raise money for a design project, or a theater project, or even more of a a creative one, like you're trying to raise money for a novel, a lot of the techniques that we talk about are applicable for multiple categories on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. That being said, obviously not everything is the same. You can always dive into the podcast archives and pick one of the episodes that stands out to you. You know, if you see one that sort of jumps out to you or you really resonate with one of the people I've had on this show, go and listen to that one. You know, this is a free resource, a free library of interviews that I have conducted for you to make the fundraising process that much easier. And as always, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll get notifications when new episodes come out. Without further ado, Let's get into today's episode and learn how this individual raised over $65,000 for a film on Kickstarter. Alana, welcome to the podcast. Where are you hailing in from? Hi, thank you for having me. I am hailing in from Long Beach, California. Okay, cool. And you also have some kittens by your side, I understand. I do, Two little, uh, they're about four months old now. So if, they, if you hear a squeak or a meow, that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, they're, I, they're named after the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, April O'Neil and Leonardo. Leonardo. Ooh, that's a cool name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I sort of want to paint the picture here for the podcast listeners who are sort of interested in how we linked up. And I don't know if you remember, but going back to the, the very first email that you sent me, and this is sort of what got me or got you on my radar. Do you remember what you said in that first email at all? I do. Um, I reached out to you just to say thank you, basically, um, for the content you provide on crowdfunding because it's been valuable to me. Um, and also for your advice about um, 
street campaigning, like live campaigning, not on online. Um, so yeah, that was why I reached out. And, and this was like the pretty much the end of January. What sort of frame of mind were you in there? Like you were gearing up for the campaign. What, what sort of emotions were you feeling then? Actually, that was about, it must have been like a week or two into my campaign. So it was the infamous and terrifying mid-campaign slump uh, <laughs> that I was in when I reached out to you. Um, and uh, my frame of mind was just trying to come up with anything I could possibly think of to push through to the finish line um, and trying not to panic. <laughs> so, so what had happened, though? So I understand you did raise a, a decent amount of money within that first week. Um, what, yeah. what sort of happened there? Well, OK, so um, I did, um, you know, kind of a I don't know what you call it, a pre-launch, pre a preload, um, where I basically recruited like 25 people that uh, I know and love, friends, family, people, because um, I'm a filmmaker, so fellow filmmakers, um, and asked, you know, told them about my campaign. Uh, this was a couple weeks prior to the campaign launching, told them about the campaign and asked if they would support and basically help promote, promote the campaign and try to get pledges. And they were all on board. Um, and they, I knew that they would all also pledge, um, fairly large amounts as well. So without that built in support system, there's no way I would have, you know, ventured, uh, to do a camp Kickstarter campaign in the first place. Um, but, um, yeah, just having them knowing that I had their support was huge, and knowing that I'd have their pledges. And I'd also read, you know, in researching and preparing to do a Kickstarter, I'd read that having a, a big opening is really important because you can potentially get picked up as a project we love by Kickstarter, mm -hmm. which didn't end up happening for me anyway, but um, but that's fine. Um, but but that was one of the, the things that I read is like, if you have a really big, you know, burst at the opening, that that can help you get seen. And so that was really important to me. And I emphasized that to those people, like we need to get people, you know, pledging right away. So that was a big part of the messaging that we sent out. Um, and I think that's what got the big rush in the beginning. You had a very ambitious goal here for about $65,000. So it looks like here looking at your kick track stats, you hit around the, the $20,000 mark within that first week, which is super impressive. I mean, considering um, so many different film campaigns just struggle to get funding and also mm -hmm. the the $65,000 goal, that's really uh, ambitious to, to consider that you reach that far in that first week. I think that's actually a really great job. Thank you. It was so, a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine also just a lot of worrying, you know, is having oh, all yeah. those ducks in the row, making sure people actually show up at the campaign. Yeah. So what happened then after that initial rush? You see all of these people coming in and pledging. You're getting notifications. You know, it's, it's a really exciting time. And then you sort of hit that period that many campaigners face uh, where mm -hmm. maybe they've reached out to their core network and now they're like, okay, where am I going to go from here? What, what was that like? Yeah, it's uh, horrible. <laughs> 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 Crowdfunding is definitely not for the faint of heart. I will say that. Um, it's... It's just really scary, especially as an artist, because you've and it's, and, well, and especially if you really, really care about what you're putting out there, because it's just such a vulnerable place to be, something you've really poured your blood, sweat and tears into. Um, and the, the, con the concept trailer, um, my campaign has a concept trailer on the page um, to show like my vision for the film so people could really get a taste of what I'm what I'm trying to do. Um and that was a lot of work and that caught, you know, I paid for that out of my own pocket. So it was just a lot of heart in this project mm. and a lot, I feel riding on it. So when it gets to the point where, you know, it's like, um, what I had read was like the middle 10 days is where pledges start to, to kind of dry up. And I had actually read that, uh, I'd read some, one person who said that there was a point where for a stretch of days, he got not a single pledge. Wow. And that actually that never happened to me. Thank God. <laughs> uh -huh. There were always a few, at least a few pledges every day, but um, still to go from so many pledges in the first week, uh, so many pledges, especially in the first few days to then, you know, a week later, 
Mm-hmm. It's really trickling to like a really slow, uh, slow kind of a trickle. trip. Yeah. Yeah. Trickle was really scary. And then, you know, just, um, pulling out all the stops, basically, you know, I had kind of a little, little arsenal of extra things that, uh, I had planned to, to push later. So like, for instance, I had my, uh, tr- my concept trailer that I pushed in the very beginning. And then, uh, that was w- when it started to slow down is when I started to do campaign updates. So my first update was <clears throat> a behind the scenes video of a table read that I'd done for the script uh, a couple years ago. And I had someone come in and shoot the table read and, and, and there's an interview with me in this video. So I'm talking about the film and what, it, you know, the significance of the film. And it's kind of like a behind the scenes look at the film. And that seemed to re- really resonate with people. And so I got a new kind of little flood of pledges with that. And then, so every update I would do, um, I would get a, like a little mini burst and that kind of carried us through the middle, I think. And as we go with this interview, I really want to talk about some key things like the big backers that you had who pledged, you know, over a thousand dollars. But right mm-hmm. now I'd actually just to, like to learn a little bit more about the film because ironically you putting yourself out there being extremely authentic is very brave and it's kind of also in line with the message of the the film strangely enough so could, mm-hmm. you, could you tell the the listeners here a little bit about the film and also the message behind it yeah absolutely um it's it's a film about four women living through the Rwandan genocide. Basically, it's these four women who become trapped as they're hiding in an underground compartment uh, for 81 days through the genocide. And these four women all come from very different backgrounds. So um, uh, the basically, to give you a little bit of background on the, the Rwandan genocide, it was basically a civil war, the culmination of their civil war between Hutus and Tutsis. So um, actually, you know, it's it's in Rwanda and it seems really far away and... and um, not relatable, but actually it's quite relatable to the United States and to actually what we're going through today with all of our racial tension. So uh, there were Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda, the two different ethnic groups that were kind of warring for many years. And the Rwandan genocide was the culmination where Hutus were literally massacring Tutsis by the thousands every day. And it, and it ended up about 800,000 to a million uh, is estimated that died within a three month span of time. So really horrific genocide and these, and it was a, a lot of the men were killed. It was, it was, you know, they put a machete in your hand and it was kill or be killed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so a lot of the women were, um, were either hiding or, you know, taken captive or, um, whatever. So this is a scenario where these four women, um, are hiding and one is a Hutu, uh, two are Tutsi and one is actually an American volunteer who was over in Rwanda, um, well, you know, when the genocide broke out and she ends up getting swept into the in swept up and taken into this room with them. And uh, also just want to say that this is um, inspired by true by by true events. It's not totally uh, not ever, the characters are fictionalized and um, the this the events that happen to them in the room are fictionalized. But the larger uh, backdrop, the larger story, it tracks along true events and true mm. uh, true occurrences throughout the genocide. So, so yeah, it's these women in this room and, and they come from these different, different perspectives and they really, they're kind of at each other's throats at the start and they have to learn to rely on each other to survive. And they, they, they not only learn to rely on each other, they come to love each other. They come to, um, they form this, this amazing sisterhood. And so it's, it's a story of unity and resilience and hope. Um, so it's actually really, uh, topical right now. I wrote the script like four years ago, but, um, and yeah. it, this also this we're recording this the day after International Women's Day. So it is very right. <laughs> the dates are syncing up here. Um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> what what actually then was your your role here or did you then go from everything from writing to production like could you give the listeners a bit of an idea of what your role was in the film? Yeah, so um I conceived of it. Another sorry, another thing I wanted to say about it too that I totally just blanked out on was that um part of the inspiration for, for writing the story was I came across, um, the fact that, uh, Rwanda has the highest percentage percentage of women appointed to government in the world. And so, as you just mentioned, international women's day was yesterday and we're here in the United States, we're marching and we're, you know, the women's movement is still a huge thing in this country. And we want more women in politics and in, in the corporate world and in positions of power to, to make change. 
And it's so interesting and such a little known fact that Rwanda has the highest percentage of women in government in the world. And I just thought that was so fascinating for these women to come from such a place of total chaos and despair. And I mean, I can't even imagine to then yeah. rise up and, and become national leaders. So I just thought it's such an inspiring story for, for the world to, to know these women. Um, but I'm sorry, what was your question? You said, Oh, my process for how yeah. I was involved. Yes. So I, I have done, <laughs> I've done pretty much everything. I mean, with, with a lot of support, but it's like, you know, every, every project has a motor. I'd say I'm the motor for this. So I wrote the script. Um, I, produced the concept trailer. I, I put every piece together. I produced the concept trailer. I financed the concept trailer. I, um, I directed it. I'm, I will be directing the feature film. Um, I put the campaign together. Uh, so, so yeah, it's my baby. <laughs> and, and yeah. And you scouted out all of the actresses that, yeah, that helped, cast, all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> I put together the cast and crew. Yeah. That's, that's phenomenal. And just that organizational ability. Wow. Um, that's really incredible to to hear. Um, was this then something that was always going to be on Kickstarter, or were you trying to fund this in other ways? What was that like? Um, that decision. Yeah. So I initially, um, when I was writing the script, I wrote it as they say, "quote unquote" small uh, in the movie industry. It's a small story, but it's really what it is. It's contained. It's a contained story. It's it's basically in one room the entire time, very, um, almost like claustrophobic. Uh, and there are only like four exterior shots where we go outside the room, but, um, I wrote it contained to be affordable so that I could, I, I always, I always figured, you know, this is a, a film I'm going to make myself and I'm going to fund myself somehow. And I didn't always know how Kickstarter or crowdfunding was always kind of in the back of my mind, but it was something I didn't want to do because it's terrifying. Um, I really didn't want to, have to resort to it. Uh, obviously I ended up doing it anyway, but, um, so, so my initial plan was I, I wrote the script small so that I could shoot it, uh, fairly easily. Um, and actually from the script, I ended up, um, getting representation. I ended up, uh, a, an agent, um, came across the script and, and signed me. And then I also have managers now as well. And so then they, you know, they fell in love with the script and they started shopping it. And, uh, I had lots of meetings, uh, and, you know, lots of interest in the film, but they kept saying that there's no place in the market for this film. It's too small. It's too small. Uh, which, you know, you look at a film like Moonlight, which just won the Academy Award. So small films can go big. Um, totally. And I mean, it, yeah. th that's, that's such like the classic story too. Like you even have movies like Rocky that no yeah. one expects to go anywhere and they end up being really big hits because people resonate with the main characters in the story. Um, mm -hmm. I do want to give also the listeners an idea here. So you were looking to raise $65,000 at that point. Had you then already like officially signed on the actresses and all of that kind of stuff, or is this kind of banking on the campaign? This is banking on the campaign. I think I don't totally understand your question. Sorry. Like if you had not raised this money, would you then not be going forward with the project or would it be, you'd have to find other financing routes or what was yeah. that like? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this was kind of my last resort, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is what also made it really, really scary. I was like, man, if we don't get this money, I like, I honestly don't know where it's going to come from because you can apply for grants and you can apply for those things, but it's like small bits. It's like $10,000 here, $5,000 there. It's a little bit. So it would take a while to, Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and you don't always know other people are applying for those grants and you're not necessarily going to get, you know, all the, the funding that you apply for necessarily. Um, you know, I, I, there are another option, which is like saving up the money myself for the next five years, but I really want to make this movie as soon as possible. So I didn't, I didn't want to do that. Uh, but yeah, it was sort of a last resort and really important to, that I got the money. <laughs> I can only imagine, too, the amount of stress that you must have felt. The fact that you had launched this campaign, your credibility is on the line. All of these actresses, all of these makeup artists, etc., are pretty much looking to you to lead this thing. And you hit that period in your campaign where you're like, oh, shoot, like, did I just max out? You know, you're, you've, you're, mm -hmm. the funding meter is sort of slowing. It's going from a trickle. And then you sort of, it seems like, collect yourself and figure out, okay, we're going to go forward. So that's really where I want to ask you here now, looking forward around that midday campaign, I start to see the trajectory really climbing up here. 
and um, you're getting more and more pledges. You're seeing really big jumps in pledges. What were you doing there to actually make this campaign a success? You know, it's funny you use the word max out, and it's it's so it's the perfect description because it really did feel like, oh my God, am I maxed out? Like, have I literally reached the edges of my network? Like, is there is there anyone else who I can get funding from? Um, and I think a big part of how we were able to get those big jumps, um, honestly, is the energy you put out there, the um, staying positive. Like, obviously, I can't as as much as I in, inside internally, I'm like freaking out. Uh, you know, the the and I was in constant contact with the 25 people I said I that were helping me, um, and just e- emailing them and keeping them <clears throat> encouraged. And not being like, oh my God, you guys, this, this campaign is going to fail. Like, you know, never allowing that to be, become like a, become real, you know, and just basically letting them know we can do it. And I, I need you guys to push harder. I need you guys to send another email today. I need you guys to everyone, like we're going to, you know, we're all going to tweet this out today. We're all going to, and just keeping that going, um, as much as possible, And honestly, there's luck. I have to admit, you know, I I can't, I can't say that if I were to do this again, that it would happen the same way or that I would be successful because there, there are definitely elements of luck. Some of the really big pledges I got, I didn't expect. um, And some of them came from people I've never even met. Mm. So just, that's a big part of it too. I mean, reaching the right people at the right time and somewhat trusting the universe that that's going to happen uh, was really, I mean, we, we had a big jump in the middle and that was really like just kind Mm -hmm. of a miracle. So I I have a ton of questions, but I just want to first say here that in some ways you're like the leading role here and you're deciding how the story could go. And certain stories can become tragedies. Certain can become very inspirational and very thankfully your story became inspirational because you made it so. So I want to ask you, you know, in terms of these a thousand dollar pledges, and these mm-hmm. strangers that were backing your campaign, where did that where did that come from? Did they hear about it from friends of friends? Did they pledge? Do you have to do any sort of nurturing to get those big donors to pledge? Could you mm-hmm. shed some light on that? I'm speaking to the crowdfunders in the audience who have already launched a Kickstarter campaign. We've actually even successfully run a campaign. And the reason is, I think you will understand this pain point most. And that is, when you finally do raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the hardest part is not collecting the cash. The hardest part is shipping out all of those perks and rewards to your backers. It is a nightmare, my friends. It's a lot of spreadsheets, it's a lot of headache, and it's a lot of stress. That's why I recommend BackerKit. If you have not heard of BackerKit, they help you collect surveys, they help you collect data, and the entire fulfillment process is just so much easier and so many less spreadsheets when you use their software. You can check them out at backerkit.com and use CrowdCrux for a special discount. Yeah, yeah. um, Honestly, some were family, which those, those ones I expected them to pledge, but not as much as they pledged. Uh, and then some were, um, people I knew sort of like peripherally, if you could say that, like friends of friends. And then some were literally people that saw it on Facebook that I did not know. And they just pledged because the, the, the content really spoke to them. Do you think then it was the, like that Facebook post you posted was shared and they saw it or like one of your friends in that 25 core group was sharing your campaign? Like, where do you think they found that post? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's really funny actually. So it got, so all the people I've I've recruited who were helping me were blasting it out. And I think then from there, people who would see it on their pages then started sharing it as well. Um, because it was so funny. So my brother, um, told me that he was sharing it with, uh, uh, another woman in his office and he started getting involved and was trying to share it with people and spread it around. And he went to this one, um, this one woman that he works with and he showed it to her and, she said, Oh, I've already seen this. This is, <laughs> this is online. I've seen this already. <laughs> and I was, she told me that story and I was like, Oh my God, that's crazy. Like someone totally removed and she didn't know who I was. She didn't know that I was this, the sister of this person she works with. But anyway, so that was really kind of amazing to me when he told me that, that it was just getting out there. Mm-hmm. People um, sharing it. So 
I was looking to at sort of the recap you were giving me um, that the Rwandan media got involved in, in some way. Oh, yes. Yeah. That was another were another, another source of a really big push when I started to get another. I got a um, I got a 10K donor, which was crazy. Uh, so she has an executive producer credit and she's a, a person I've, I've never met in person. Um, and just, she has a, her grandmother, um, is a Holocaust survivor. And since it's so such a similar situation to, you know, the Holocaust, uh, she it just really resonated with her and she wanted to be, be heavily involved. Um, so wait, so she, did she discover it through the Rwandan media or from Facebook? Yeah, that was what, uh, that was what encouraged her to, to pledge that at that level. She didn't, she, she saw, cause when, when I discovered via Twitter, uh, mm. that they, that the Rwandan media had gotten involved, they, they saw my campaign on Twitter, not solicited by me at all for their involvement. Actually, it was something that didn't even occur to me, uh, to ask the Rwandan media to get involved, but I saw, um, you know, a post and we were hashtagging Rwanda and hashtagging genocide, which is how I'm sure they came across it. And so they wrote this article that's in Kenya, Rwanda. I can't even read it. I can't understand what it says. <laughs> you can read the people's names and it's just so cool. It's such a beautiful article. He, the, the writer did such an, a wonderful job sourcing images and sourcing all the information without ever having reached out to me beforehand. Um, and so, so I see, I see this article, I, I click and, and it's just this full, you know, feature on trees of peace and it has a link to the Kickstarter campaign. So I could see, okay, that this person is promoting the campaign. And, um, so then I, I was, I thought that was amazing. I was like over the moon when I saw that. Cause that's like, you know, that's the biggest endorsement I feel you can get. You know, I really want to honor these people and honor these women. So, um, to me, that was just a huge win. And when I shared that with my, my existing backers and I shared it on social media, um, that I think that got another really big burst. And that was when some bigger pledges came through. What I love so that about was inspiring a lot of people. Mm hmm. Uh, what I love about that is as you're putting yourself out there, you never know what can happen. Just sharing this story, you have no idea who can resonate with that, who might discover yeah. it on Twitter, on Facebook, and all those little things that you do. Some of them, you know, maybe no one sees. Someone does see that post. They decide to share it, and you get a backer. So you never really know. Um, but I do want to circle back here. So in terms of this $10,000 backer, the person who pledged to your campaign. So they mm -hmm. discovered this then on Twitter? On Facebook. On Facebook. And mm -hmm. they connect it with the fact that your story resonated in their own mind with what they had experienced or, I guess, uh, what they've witnessed. Yeah, yeah. So at the start of the script, there's a quote from Anne Frank because Anne Frank, you know, was living basically in this room. She was trapped in a room trying to survive. Very, very similar scenario to the story I wrote. And so at the beginning of my script, there's an, an Anne Frank quote. And that quote is, um, I incorporated that quote into the behind the scenes video on the Kickstarter campaign page. Um, and the, and the quote is just basically about the strength of women. And, uh, so I think that, you know, if you can make the, the parallels, um, between my story, between the Rwandan genocide and the Holocaust, you know, the parallels are pretty apparent, but if it's not that apparent, this quote really drives it home that there are these parallels. And so this woman who obviously went to the campaign page and checked it out, uh, I think seeing that quote really, really just drove it home for her because like I said, her grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. And so for her, uh, you know, she was like, I can afford to, to pledge at this amount and it's really meaningful to me. And I want to, you know, honor and celebrate women like this, uh, for my grandma. So, wow. so yeah, so it's really important to her. Yeah. She's amazing. And she was like, once she got involved, she was promoting it and posting about it. And she's, she's like, she's like an angel. <laughs> and this, this was the final Saturday of the campaign. Yep. Yeah. What, what did that feel like for you having organized all of this, you know, it really poured your, your blood, sweat and tears into this thing. And to see that people are resonating with the story, what did that feel like for you? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, it's, it's why, it's why I, I'm doing this. I think it's why people tell stories. So I cried <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so excited because I felt like, I felt like, you know, also when, how I talked about like energy earlier and, and keeping, you know, 
keeping that positivity going. Um, it's like, if you believe something can happen, you believe it enough and you have this kind of this, you feel this like force, um, her, her pledge really, I think just, it really just drove us through to the end. I mean, it was like, uh, you know, I'll never know if we would have gotten there with, without her pledge, but I really feel like her pledge just brought in the rest sort of, Mm -hmm. uh, it's like we got that jump. And then just from there, it just kept going. Yeah. I'm sure it created, you know, unbelievable momentum. Right. It's also just such an amazing story. I mean, even hearing that now, like, wow, it's incredible. And even if I was a supporter of that campaign, that would make me want to push it even harder. You know, like it feels yeah. like it's it's almost like meant to be in some ways. Yeah. Cause, and then, yeah. And then like from there, a lot of people who were already backers started increasing their pledges. So it just, I think it made people really want to help help this, this thing cross the finish line. For, for you going forward now, so your next plan, I guess, is to fulfill all of these rewards, everything that you've promised, et cetera. Um, how do you think that this is going to change the trajectory of your career? Uh, I, I, I hope that it puts me on the map as a filmmaker. I think part of, like I said, a part of the reason when uh, my, my, my reps were shopping the script over the last two years and it was, you know, it's getting meetings and getting an incredible feedback on the script, but you know, nobody would give me the money to make the film. I think a large part of that is that the industry, uh, well, one is very heavily, (laughs) heavily, uh, biased against female directors. That's a whole other topic. (laughs) Um, but, uh, I'm a first time feature director. So I think that also, you know, that's a big risk that, that a lot of even small independent studios weren't willing to take. Mm. And, uh, so I think, uh, Hopefully, you know, I know I'm going to make a beautiful film and I, and I'm going to get into some film festivals and hopefully, you know, it gets eyes on it and it gets people going, oh, okay, this girl can make, this girl can make a movie and that, you know, maybe that'll open doors for me to keep making more. Yeah. I I mean, the game isn't over yet. That's really like what you said. It's all about now what you do going forward, um, which is really exciting too. Um, I do want to get into a few just technical questions, but before we, <laughs> we do, I just wanted to ask one more high level question here. And that is that I have, uh, I'd say about 70% of my audience is male centric. And, uh, there are also a lot of female crowdfunders who are doing it for the first time. And I was just kind of curious here, was there anything that you think was unique being a female launching one of these projects? Or do you think it, you, know, you didn't really notice anything like that? Hmm. I did not notice anything like that. Um, like I said, like I mentioned a second ago, I think, you know, I, I probably is particular to the industry you're in. Uh, like I said, there are not many female directors and there's not a lot of opportunity for women to direct movies. It's really, it's really kind of a travesty. Uh, so for me, that was more my mentality, like being a filmmaker and trying to fund a film. Um, the question of whether people would back it if it would be this sort of this like a a, a micro uh like a microcosm of the larger industry like are people going to not be willing to back me or take me seriously because I'm a woman that was a little bit in the back of my mind like okay feeling like if, if I'm a if I was a white man would I would I be able to raise more money um but you know I so that that was like a little thought but it, it didn't change the way I campaigned and it seems like it didn't really affect you to the degree that it definitely does in in certain decision making kind of uh, industries like that. Right. Yeah. We we fund it. So yay. Well, what's so cool to me about that too is it's really going past the decision maker, and that's why I love crowdfunding and Kickstarter is because you're removing all of those various decision makers who get to say yes, you can make this, but not that, and instead you're going directly to the people that are actually going to watch this film or the people that are going to buy the product or et cetera. That's what I absolutely uh, love about Kickstarter and crowdfunding. So that's, that's yes. pretty, pretty cool to hear. Um, yeah. Okay. So I just had a few questions here. Um, so number one, in in terms of your outreach, did you use any type of tools or email marketing or anything like that for social media even? I didn't for social media. I used MailChimp for my email list. Um, but for social, I didn't, you know, I'm familiar with like Hootsuite and Buffer, but I didn't do that. Everything I did was, um, was just, you know, right then and there <clears throat> on the spot. So Okay. And MailChimp, for those who aren't familiar, 
allows you to basically send out like a mass email. Was there anything else that you used MailChimp for like analytics at all? Um, I would look at my open rates and my click through rates and try to, you know, see what, what headlines were working or not and try to tailor my future messaging around that a little bit. So yeah. And did you, in, in terms of the breakdown of the pledges to the campaign, were you seeing most of them coming from Facebook? What, what were like you say the top three, maybe four sources there? Facebook was definitely number one. Okay. And then, yeah, I'm not sure after that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, the other question I did have is going backwards. If you were to go back into the actual pre-launch of this campaign, and I know that you know you're a smash success here. But um, would you have done anything differently on the marketing side? I would say, you know, I I sent out an email per week. And it's funny, I, uh, I sent out my emails on Mondays. And I didn't want to spam people. I really <laughs> hate that. I hate getting spammed. Um, so I, and, and I, I talked to other campaigners who sent out, you know, their emails more often, maybe twice a week or, and I'd seen people that would send out an email almost every day. And I really didn't want to do that. In hindsight, you know, looking back, it's funny. My biggest days were always Mondays. (laughs) So, um, and, and I kind of thought, Oh, it's, it's the biggest day because it's a Monday and it's, you know, people, people, and it's also a known thing. People don't really pledge over the weekends. Like the weekends are always slow Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and so I felt like, I felt like Monday was just a good day and a, a day where people come back and they're ready to jump, jump back into their things and they'll do the, the things they need to do. And if you want to pledge to a campaign that's, you know, on your to-do list, they'll, you'll knock it out. So I kind of attributed the the numbers on Mondays to that. But in hindsight, I really think it probably was also part, part email outreach, um, which is weird because it wasn't the pledges that would come through were always from the emails, but it was, I always got the most pledges on Mondays. So anyway, um, I think that I would, be less afraid to spam people and be, be more, come more from a place of like, I have this amazing, um, story that I want to share. And if it's not for you, that's fine. But, uh, but I, I believe in this and it's not spam. It's, it's art and it's beautiful. And it's something that you should see. And it's something I want to share from you. And coming from that place, I think I'd, I would have been more comfortable with, um, emailing maybe twice a week or I don't know, maybe even three times a week. Mm. Uh, I, I kind of wonder in hindsight, how that would have gone if, if I maybe would have, I don't know, gotten not had, you know, the middle, the middle slump would have maybe been a little bit less scary or I'm not sure, but, but I definitely think that the emails were effective. So it, maybe in, email a little bit more. In terms of those people who were on that email list, were, the, were these your friends and family? Were these people that you've worked with in the past or were these people that maybe subscribed on your website? Who were these people? Mm hmm. Um, it was uh, every person I have ever corresponded with in my inbox. <laughs> so <laughs> you can it was literally uh, so you can you can uh, through Outlook, you can extract there's like a tool you can use to extract literally every every person you've ever corresponded with, um, because you can't you can't just, you know, send emails to people who you've never um, who like who you, who you don't have permission to send emails to. Right. So mm-hmm. I was like, okay, these are people I've corresponded with previously in the past and they may not remember me, but you know, at least I know who they are. So, uh, so I had had that list extracted that list from my inbox. Um, so yeah, so probably friends, family, um, people that I, you know, people that I've interacted with before in various scenarios were all on my list. Did you see any of your pledges from Twitter at all? Or was it mainly, I guess, a way to, to sort of connect with influencers who are out there? There was a, there was a little bit of, uh, there were some from Twitter, yes. Um, not nearly as many as Facebook or email. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were a lot of, uh, I forget what Kickstarter calls it, but like the direct, um, yeah, where they just go to your page so they know. So I'm guessing that maybe also a source from email or from, I'm not totally sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, there was, there were some from Twitter, but I'd say the biggest benefit of Twitter was, um, networking and connecting like, like the Rwandan media, how they found, how they found us through Twitter. Yeah. I mean, it seems that way to me. And I also just so many people consume news on Twitter. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the, the other question I had for you here. So, um, 
did you do any kind of paid marketing outreach for the campaign? Because I know there are a lot of different services out there. You can also even do like Facebook ads and those types of things. Did you do any kind of paid outreach? I did not. I didn't do any paid outreach. Um, oh, actually, no, that's not true. I'm sorry. I did. I did paid Facebook ads. Um, I did a few of those and I did uh, my own press release so that I used PR web for my press release. It was like $350. I think the package I chose and uh, I do not recommend it. I got zero pledges from, <laughs> from my press release. Um, I got a lot of headline impressions and a lot of clicks, but uh, yeah, not, not really any pledges. I think it's really hard to get pledges from total, total strangers. I think, you know, Facebook, even though, like I say, some of my biggest pledges came from people who were, are technically strangers to me. When you're on social media, you can see pictures of the people and it, you know, it just doesn't totally feel like you're just a stranger. So, um, I think blind strangers probably will not pledge or are unlikely to pledge. Um, so yeah, so the, the press release and the Facebook ads, um, and, uh, you know, I don't really know how the Facebook ads, um, how they performed. I'd say, cause th th there's no way to tell, unfortunately from the Kickstarter, what it just shows you what percentage is coming from Facebook. Um, and I didn't unfortunately use the proper tracking on my ads. I wish I had done that now in hindsight. Um, but yeah, so I'm not sure if the ads were. Sorry, my kittens are going crazy. <laughs> I'm trying. To, <laughs> I'm trying to wrangle them. They're making all this noise. They're getting restless over there. <laughs> they are. I'm like guys, be quiet. Stop it. That, that's um, so funny. Um, <laughs> well, that, that's such a that's a lot of great information um, for the listeners who are looking to uh, specifically if they're doing more of a creative project, how to get the word out, um, where to expect pledge sources from, et cetera. I think there's just been just a, a ton of information that um, to me has been really interesting based on your story and also I think really actionable. So thank you for coming on the podcast and, and sharing all of that. Um, I'm going to give you the last word here. If you would like to share um, a bit of advice or a word of encouragement to um, the people listening to this podcast, this is your time to do it. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I really hope that what I've said is helpful to somebody listening. Um, and again, I, I guess I would just say, you know, if you're doing a Kickstarter campaign, make sure you really do your homework, really research and prepare. And uh, I highly, highly recommend doing like a, a preload or a pre launch where you you have as many people as you, as you can, you know, I, like I said, I did 25, but if you can get 50, get 50 who, you know, are going to pledge who, you know, are going to pledge somewhat generously to give you a, a big push in the beginning and who, you know, you'll be able to rely on throughout the campaign because doing it alone would just be so, so hard. Um, and then also just to encourage you and, and let you know that, like they say, the mid campaign slump happens and you hope it won't happen to you, but I think it just, it just happens, you know, unless you're one of those people who, your campaign takes off in the first two days and you're over your goal, which happens, you know, sometimes, um, mm. uh, you know, that, that mid campaign slump is going to happen. People just, you know, they pledge in the beginning or they pledge at the end and in the middle, it just kind of falls into a lull and not to panic and just keep the faith and, um, and good luck. Very well said. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast and also good luck with your upcoming film. Thank you so much, Sal. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman, and I want to take a second to highlight a recent iTunes review. So we're at 154 reviews. Thank you, everyone, who has taken a second to leave one of these reviews. It always means a lot to me, and it's a great way to get feedback on my own work. Okay, so this review was left by Karate Wolfpunk on March 28th, 2017. It's a bit of a longer review, and it reads, When doing research on how to successfully launch my Kickstarter campaign, I came across Sal's work. I think it's impossible to do this kind of research without doing so, since he has such a large presence in the community. His enthusiasm for the content is very genuine, and the guests that he acquires for this podcast are useful resources. Now, my only problem with the podcast is navigating the episodes. There are so many buzzwords like tricks, secrets, strategies, etc. that I'll look at the description of an episode and not know what it's about. 
with over 100 episodes at this point. I just can't hit play on every single one of them. Leading up to my project, I went through the list and listened to those that I thought would be applicable to my situation. I wasn't disappointed. At some point, I'm going to need to sit down or more aptly clean my room and listen to all of them. If you are in the industry or are months away from your crowdfunding campaign launch, I suggest you try to play through all of the episodes. Okay, first of all, that was a long that was a long review. Let me take a, a breath of air here. But thank you for leaving that review and also all the amazing feedback in that review. Like that's a really long review. I'm sure it took you a while to write that. I appreciate it. I also thank you for recognizing my own hard work in building up my community. Um, honestly, you know, people look at what I'm doing, the YouTube video, the podcast, the blog, etc., kickstarterforum.org, and they think, wow, that's a, that's a lot of stuff. I honestly just started it like one by one. You know, I started the forum in 2013, started the blog in 2012, started the podcast, I think, in 2015. Um, and, and I just kind of took it one by one, you know, writing the books, publishing the courses, all of that kind of stuff. And it, the one, if you want to know a secret, I have written over 760 blog posts. That's a lot. <laughs> I've uh, on my forum, kickstarterforum.org, I personally have written over 3,000 forum posts. That's insane, right? <laughs> That's a lot. Um, and even the podcast, like over 150 episodes. YouTube right now is over 90 videos. And part of the reason I wanted to do that was there was no free information whatsoever out there when I got started. Like there was nowhere that people could turn. So I wanted to create sort of like a bedrock resource that people could use to get the basics of crowdfunding. And sort of me also rationalizing that um, this is a way that people can, I guess, improve the, the, the rate at which they are successful. Because when I first got started, a lot of people were failing with their Kickstarter campaigns. And now at least there's more of a proven success path that you can follow. Now, I also want to address some of the criticism in this review. So basically, from what I've taken away, this person thinks or believes that my podcast is not uh, organized well for consumption. If you're trying to learn a bunch of different things or you have a specific topic you're trying to learn, um, that it's not as well organized. And this might surprise you, but I'm going to agree with you. When I first started the podcast, I didn't even think of archives. You know, I didn't even think of what's going to look good in terms of a structured archive. Um, my own process with titling the episodes is, okay, I know people are busy. I know people have a lot of things that are commanding their attention. How do I get someone to want to listen to a 60 or a 40 minute episode? You know, how do I entice people to spend that time and it's not out of a way that's manipulative. It's honestly out of a way, like I know you're gonna get a lot of value out of spending 30 minutes with me. I know it's going to really drastically improve your success. Um, and in terms of the amount of money you raise, in terms of whether or not you're even successful on Kickstarter, so how can I make the process easier? So every time I title an episode, I think to myself, will this emotionally make someone wanna click this link and want to listen to it? And that's probably why a lot of my episodes might seem very hypey or that that's also why you know I try to make promises in the title like this is how this person raised this amount of money or you will learn how to promote your campaign on Facebook or Instagram because I also want to deliver with those titles. You know I think the definition of clickbait sort of is when you aren't really delivering on your promises. You know, you're just getting attention. I don't want to do that with my podcast. I want to not only have a compelling promise, but also fulfill that promise with really meaty content and things that you can take away and implement in your campaign. And unfortunately, a byproduct of that has been maybe not as good organization. And, and that's something that I have to work in uh, or work out. And honestly, organization is, is something I'm still working at in my own personal life with my own schedule and all of these different things. So it sort of has spilled into other areas of my life. <laughs> uh, but that being said, I think in the future, I will think more about this and how I can sort of structure this in a better way. I also want the listeners to keep in mind that the podcast is a free resource 
and naturally I can only, um, I guess, focus so much attention on it for that reason. If the podcast was a premium resource where I charged people to listen to it, I would feel way more of an obligation and be able to focus more of my own resources and time on having a great um, organization for it. And, And that's sort of why, you know, with my online courses or my books, I really put a lot of thought into how it's organized. And I really try to make it as easy to consume as possible. You know, my last course, I spent a lot of time on making the videos engaging and short and included like drawing and all that kind of stuff to make it easy to consume. And that's something that me as a human being, you know, as a one individual, I have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of energy. So I can only focus in that way, that extreme level of focus on my really premium products. And unfortunately, the byproduct of that is that unless you are investing in my premium products, you don't get to, uh, I guess, experience those results or experience that sort of um, organization. And I don't know the answer to that. But uh, for now, that, that sort of just gives you some clue into my own mindset. Definitely, though, in the future, I want to have a more organized and easy to um, look through type of podcast archives. I just have to think of how to do that. So thank you very much, Karate Wolfpunk, for that bit of feedback. I encourage other people to um, be very honest with your iTunes reviews so I can continue to improve this show for you. But again, my name is Salvador Brigman. And I'll see you next time.